everybody. It's Leslie with the New Mexico Small Business Development Center. I want to let everyone know that today you're going to be in for a really great presentation because, again, we have Eric Spellman, who is going to teach. <laughs> he's, he's always great at what uh, he presents to us today. It's a retailer's secret to succeeding online. I want to remind everyone to type your questions into the Q&A. He'll pick them up throughout the entire presentation. If you want to raise your hand, also do that and we'll get to you just as quickly as possible. Eric, take it away. Okay, well thank you once again, Leslie, and welcome to all of you. I'm excited about this presentation because we're talking about retailers. So many people think, okay, someone goes out and starts an online business, you know, and they don't even have an office, they don't have a building, and you know, how can we survive against that? You know, um, modern day uh, retailers, you know, where they're selling to people who walk in off the street and come in and they're having to manage a storefront and all those added expenses. Well, how are they to deal with a pandemic? How are they to deal when they have to start selling in ways that don't require people to come in? Well, that's what we're going to be talking about here. So I'm glad you're here. Please ask questions at any time. Okay, that's what this is about. And so let's dive right into it. In order to get started, we really need to answer the question, what is online marketing? Because there's a lot of people out there uh, giving you ideas and words that aren't, they aren't accurate. Let's just put it that way. There's a lot of flim flam people out there trying to sell little black box marketing solutions uh, to retailers, you know, claiming that you know, plug this in, pay us this much per month, and all your online digital marketing is done. And you think you can just wipe your hands in it since someone else is handling it for you. That is not the case. You must be in charge of your online marketing. But what is it exactly? It's basically, uh, I mean, you're going to be reaching your target prospects, but in an online way, okay? Uh, it's pretty much everything you've been doing, but now you're using online. Whether you know it or not, you've been using marketing uh, forever. You've been promoting your company. You've been strengthening your brand. You've been encouraging and even incentivizing customers to come into your brick and mortar location. Well, we're going to be using those same rules, but we're going to be using some new techniques. Now, before I jump into some of those, you need to kind of get yourself in order because some of you out there are thinking, oh my, he's going to start talking about, you know, all this techno stuff. And I don't get that. You know, I've had my business for 38,000 years and we've never had to do online before. And now we're being forced to, and he's about to talk techno and I don't know if I'm going to understand him. You will. This is ground zero. Okay. And there is no such thing as a bad question. So please ask. Okay, this is for business owners, not for techie people. You need to think that everything you do in the online world is tied to digital marketing, tied to online marketing, from you know search engine marketing uh, to app development, email marketing. I mean, so many things are included under that umbrella. But let's start with your website. You need to think of your website as your other storefront. In fact, I'll just be honest with you, and you may disagree with me, but today, statistics show that the number one way people have a first impression with your company is online. It's not because they drove by. It's not because they walked by. It's not because they even went in your store. That is typically and statistically not the first impression they have with your company. Online is. Think about it this way. If I came up to you and said, oh my gosh, there is this great new restaurant you need to try out, you know, and I give you the name of it. Are you immediately going to go and drive to that restaurant, go in there and eat something? No. If you've never been to it, you're going to Google it. You're going to check it out online, see what people are saying, see what their menu is, see what the inside looks like, see how much it is. You're going to do a little research. Everyone does that. And that's why I'm saying, even though someone may refer your business 
to someone else, that someone else is going to Google them. That someone else is going to do some online research. And my question to you is, if I do online research about your company, what will I find? Does it represent who you are? Does it represent the quality of what you do? Or are you embarrassed for people to search online for you? Your website should be consistent with your brick and mortar location. Um, think about it this way. Your website is like the wagon wheel. It's like the hub in that wagon wheel. And all these spokes point to all the other pieces. What we're trying to do is bring in all those other pieces to your website. So someone may start out on social media here, but we want to bring them to your website. Someone may start out in an email conversation here, but we focus them to our website. Everything we do should be delivering people to our website because the website is what we call the conversion point where we're converting a looker, a browser, a shopper, to an actual customer. We want to convince them to do what we need them to do. So you basically have two goals. Here they are. You're going to sell something, e-commerce. And what that means uh, is you're going to actually put products on your website and people can actually put them in a shopping cart and using their credit card on your website, actually pay for them. And then all you have to do is ship them. That's what I mean by selling. If your goal is selling, then that's what you're doing. You're going to be taking your actual physical products or services even and putting them on your website and people can actually buy them uh, electronically. That's one way. The other way is through generating leads. Your website should be generating leads. In other words, giving you list of people that you can call, people who are interested in what you do and want to hear from you. So your website can either sell actual things or it can generate leads. And in both cases, both are how you're making money, okay? So what are the key ingredients of a website? Well, one of them is if you're a retailer and you're just starting out, your website has got to have calls to action on it. Your website has got to be telling people what to do, where to go, what to click. Too many times we think a website is like an online brochure. It's like a big billboard somewhere. You know, we're, we're just advertising. We're describing what we do. We're giving a list or a menu of products or services. Uh-uh. No, that's not what winners do. No, if you really want to win in the online world, you've got to have calls to action, which basically means telling people to call you, telling people to buy something, telling people to do something. Some people say, oh, isn't that rude, Eric? No, it's called marketing. One of the things I'm just going to share with you right now is no one says please, okay? In the marketing world, we don't use the word please. We don't say, please check out our products. Please go to our website. Uh -uh. You tell them to do it. And you tell them to do it now. Now, I know that sounds rude, but you'd be surprised. People are like sheep. They really are. And... And I'm not saying that in a derogatory way. I'm saying in that it's how we were brought up. Our, child, our, our parents, when we were children, uh, taught us to obey. They taught us that when an adult tells you to do something, you do it. And so our default, believe it or not, is to do it. If we can't think of a reason not to, we'll probably do it. So when you tell people to shop now, they are more often likely to do it than to question you. Excuse me. Your website also needs easy navigation, no clutter. I need to be able to get to any page on your website within three clicks. Did you hear me? Three clicks. If it takes more than that, you ain't getting it because everyone on the internet has ADD. Okay. We are not going to get, we don't have all the time in the world to search on your website for what we want. And if we can't find it, we're going to go to your competitor. So you've got to make it easy for people to find what you sell. You've got to make it easy that if they want, if they have any question about what you do, what you make, who you are, that they can get to it within three clicks. That also means designing your menu correctly. If you're going to be selling products, you need to prioritize them. I've had so many people tell me, Eric, I know I, I, I need to put all my products online and sell them that way, but Eric, we have 30,000 products. Do you know how long that would take? So 
I think we're just not going to do it. If the fear of adding all those products to a website is keeping you from adding all those products to a website, then you're going to be happy to hear this. You don't need to add every single product to your website. So you're probably deciding, you're probably thinking, well, how do you decide which ones? The key is to look at all of your products. And I want you to pick the products and you're going to pick 10, okay? We're just going to make our plan right now because you're going to do this. You're going to pick 10 of your products. And the way you're going to pick those 10 is, it's going to be the 10 that you make the most money on. In other words, your costs are really low, but your profit's really high. You're going to pick the 10 products that you make the most money on and are the easiest to ship. Those are the two criteria. I'm not asking you to put every product online. You pick the 10 products that meet those two criteria. Most profit, easiest to ship. And all I'm saying is you launch your website with those 10 products. And over time, you can add more products and just keep adding as you go. But don't feel like you have to have every single product on there before you open. That's such a mistake. Your website, if you're selling, needs an easy checkout. You know, a shopping cart that doesn't break. You know, it's something that's easy for, easy for people to understand. How many times have you been on a website and you wanted to buy something and it was confusing? It's like, and when things get confusing, when it's starting to ask for payments and things like that, what are you going to do? You're going to hit the road because you're not going to take a chance that you get charged twice. You're not going to take a chance that something goes wrong and someone gets your credit card. So if it's not crystal clear, how the checkout process is going to work and how, and hopefully a quick process without too many click next, click next, click next. If you can guarantee an easy checkout, people are practically there. And if you're gonna be doing leads, then you need to install, and I say install like it's software. You need to set up, and I've already given this talk, so you can go back and watch it. Uh, on the trade. And I believe it's the one on generating leads. Leslie, I'll let you look that one up. I don't have the titles in front of me. But I talk about a thing called the trade, where basically when you're trying to generate a lead from your website, you are really trying to get their information. Okay. That's what a lead is. You want someone to give you their information because there is no way for you to look at the web statistics on your website and, and be able to see who it was. It's impossible. All you can do is look at footsteps and follow where they went. So the only way we're going to get a lead from a website is if we convince someone to give us their information. And like I said, that's a whole hour long talk on the secret to getting people to giving you their information. Okay, so go back and watch that one, or I'll probably be talking about it again in another upcoming topic. You need to drive qualified traffic, which means you need to learn to rank well on Google. Uh, you need to make sure that, and when I say rank well, I mean show up on the first page for a search. You know, Google's only going to give you 10 organic searches. When you do a search on Google, it's going to give you 10 options, 10 choices. Now, it's going to add to that a little. It's going to add some ads, you know, some people who paid to be there. But Google per page will always give you 10, 10 results that it thinks are relevant to that search. And so, the question is, are you relevant for the searches that people are doing? Are you showing up on the first page? Now, some of y'all are going, well, Eric, I'm not showing up on the first page, but I am on the second. Is that not okay? People listen. If you are not on the first page, you don't exist. If you're not on the first page of Google, I don't care whether you're number one on Google, but if you're not on the first page of Google results, you don't exist because no one will ever go there. What ends up happening is if people don't find what they want on the first page of Google results, they will change their search. Very few actually go to page two. You need to claim your Google Plus page or the Google Business page or whatever they're calling it these days. This is one of the keys if you have a website. It's not enough just to have a website. You need to 
teach Google about your company so that when people search on products and services, Google will start serving up those results in local results. You probably noticed that when you do a search in Google, say for pizza, it starts showing you local pizza places and it'll even tell you their hours. How did Google even know that? Because those business owners told Google on their Google Plus page, okay? Now, if you're wondering how to do that, I'll be honest, it's a little complicated and it can be a little convoluted. Google does not make it as easy as they could. So the easy way to get you to do this for free and easy and get it done in a single day is for you to contact one of your SPDC counselors. These people have been given a special app, an actual app on their phone, where they can get a lot of this information up to Google directly without having to jump through all the hoops I did, uh, and most people do. And so I highly recommend it. Most people don't know that little tidbit that Google trusts the SBDC counselors more than just about anybody. So uh, just call your counselor. They'll know what we're talking about. Join the chamber. Chances are whatever city you're in is a chamber of commerce. You must, 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 must join your chamber of commerce. I can't tell you how important this is. You're saying, well, Eric, that's not a high tech deal. It is actually. Because Google, well, even a lot of the chamber of commerce don't know this. But Google loves chamber of commerce websites. Now, why does Google love them? Because those websites are fairly objective. In other words, the people in charge of the chamber aren't showing, you know, they're not, they're not showing favor, favoritism towards any single business. And so those databases of businesses, especially if they are public, you know, where the public can go to the chamber website and see all the businesses, Google gives them a very high ranking. And Google also determines that if there is a link on a chamber website from your if there's a link on the Chamber website to your website, Google's going to see that as a high value link because obviously you've been around a while and the Chamber knows you're a legitimate business. It's almost like a better business bureau thing. Uh, businesses that have a link to their website publicly from a Chamber of Commerce website will see better ranking results. I guarantee it. I've seen it. Okay, so if you haven't joined your chamber, join it. And if your chamber doesn't have a list of all those businesses with links to your website, convince them to do that because Google loves chamber of commerce. You also can get traffic uh, from AdWords. In other words, pay per click, you know, and I have a whole talk on should you pay for a click uh, and how that works. But basically, I'll be honest, you're not going to get all this marketing for free. I'm just, I'm just being, I'm not one of those people who are going to tell you, here's how you go viral for free. No, you're a business owner. You're used to paying for advertising. You're used to paying for TV commercials and radio ads and, and billboards and pamphlets and all that. Well, guess what? You're going to be dropping a little coin on this too. AdWords is Google's paid ads. And I don't have time to go into the depths of it uh, on how it all works, but just understand you need to include this as a part of what you do because you will it, you will get at least 10% of the clicks, especially if you're not ranking well on Google yet. This is how you get to page one. It's going to cost you a little bit, but it's totally controllable and totally worth it. And of course, social media. Social media is going to be one of the big drivers to your website. It's going to drive a ton of traffic to your website. So let's talk about video. Another way to drive traffic uh, is video. And, and video is more important than just about anything. Uh, I'll be honest. And I just did a talk on it not too long ago. But everyone today has ADD and they're lazy. And what I mean by that is as, they relate, as it relates to the internet. I already told you the ADD part. They don't have a lot of patience and they're not going to search your whole website for something. They're going to give, give up and go to your competition if they can't find something. But the lazy part has to do with video. In other words, people would rather watch a video than read a blog. People would rather watch a video than read a post. Okay? 
video is quickly becoming one of the most important ways to market your company. You don't have to buy a lot of equipment. You really, really don't. I, in fact, a lot of people have huge success just using their iPhone, just using their smartphone uh, to take these videos. Back on April 16th, I did a video for y'all that you can go back and watch called Five Minute Marketing Using Online Video. I highly recommend you go back and watch that on-demand presentation, especially if you missed it, because I go into great detail on uh, what you need to buy, what you don't need to buy, and some tips on how to get that first video out the door. So I highly recommend going back and watching that. But a little tip I'll give you right now as it relates to video is what I call the open box reveal. So let's say that you're a retailer. You know, every day UPS or FedEx or, or the mail is delivering packages to you, you know, probably shipments uh, of your products. What you ought to do is when one of the boxes comes in and you'll probably know what's going to be in the box, you're going to film yourself holding your phone like this as you film yourself. And you're going to film yourself opening the box. You're saying, why, Eric? Because people love it. People love an open box reveal. I remember one time I had this client and he was, he had to be like 75 years old and he ran a saddle shop here in Amarillo. He built custom saddles for horses. And he came in and talked to me and said, Eric, I, my, you know, my grandson told me that I need to do some videos and I don't even know what that's about. What do I need to buy? What do I need to do? Who do I need to hire? And I said, you don't need to buy anything. I said, just use your phone. And I want you to, and I told him what to do. I gave him step-by-step -step instructions on what to do. Didn't charge him a thing. Sent him on his way. So he sent me a, a copy of what he did. And he posted it and he saw a huge success. Here's basically, I'll just reenact it for you. And his name is Buddy. He goes, hey, this is Buddy at Buddy Saddle Shop. And I want you to know, I just got in the new shipment of uh, some good ostrich. And you know how hard it is to get ostrich these days. Let's open it up and see what we got. So what this guy would do is he would, he would aim it down and he would, Open it up, open it, pull up. Oh, wow, look at that ostrich skin. Oh, I could probably do maybe three sets of boots on that one. This is some of the best I have seen. If you want me to reserve this for you, you better let me know quick because they're going to go quick. I'll see you. That's the whole video. It was like maybe three minutes at the most. And basically all he did was open a box and show what was in it. But did you see what he did? And I told him to do that. And what he did was he didn't even post it to his website. He posted that to social media. Whenever he got a new box of some, you know, a crocodile or python or something, you know, something really cool, he would do an open box reveal. And people would call that day and buy those boots before they're even made. And it cost him nothing except a little time. Facebook. Keep in mind uh, that Facebook is going to be another way to drive that traffic to a retailer, okay? If you're a retailer, you got to remember that the majority of adults are still on Facebook. You need to build a business page if you haven't. And if you don't know how, once again, you need to call your SBDC counselors here at the NMSBDC. They are amazing, and they can tell you exactly how to build that page. Keep in mind that with Facebook, you have a personal account and you have a business account, a personal page and a business page, okay? And Facebook says it is very illegal if you use your personal page for business. If they catch you doing that, they will cancel you off of Facebook. So I highly recommend if you have a business, you must, you must, you must, you must, you must create a Facebook business page. And once again, your SBDC counselors can walk you through that. Once you've built that page and you're publishing to it, your goal is to build the fan base. Keep in mind that it's all a numbers game. Online marketing is all numbers. And let me just tell you this right now. You cannot manage what you cannot measure. And if you don't understand 
how many people are coming to visit your site and where they're coming from and how many people are coming into your store because of online and how they decided to do that. It means you're not measuring, okay? And you cannot manage what you cannot measure. So build your fan base. One of your biggest goals when you first start out in social media, and in fact, one of your biggest bowl goals if you're in social media is to build your followers. You've got to up that number because it you could you could have the most amazing content in the world, but if you only have two followers, what does it even matter? You want the largest audience possible. And when you do post, you need to follow my perfect post rules. And I've made them very, very simple. And I'm about to show them to you. And also post your videos. That's a great way. Uh, and that's what my friend did. That's what Buddy did. And that's, he made money. People weren't even going to his website. They were like seeing it on Facebook and calling him up. So what are the perfect post rules for a retailer? Now, some of you may have heard this before, uh, but it's that important. When we're talking about going online, when we're talking about making the perfect post that for business, not personal, okay? I'm not talking about you just posting a funny Garfield meme. I'm talking about you doing a post for business. There are basically four key ingredients. One is the call to attention, a photo. Every post you do on social media must have a photo. You don't get to do text posts anymore. And the reason is because when people are on Facebook, you know, they're scrolling, they're scrolling, they're scrolling, and they're just scrolling. And what are they doing? They're scanning for something interesting. And if all you have is a text post, they're going to they're gonna scroll right past you without reading anything. But you know what makes people stop? You know what makes people read a post? The picture. And so every post you do from now on, and I don't care whether it's on Facebook, wherever, whatever social media platform you're on, you're going to have a picture. And it needs a pic to be a picture that makes people stop. Next is the call to information. The call to information is what the post is about. This is, I mean, so many of y'all were doing this before. I mean, you were saying, hey, we're having a sale today. That's all you would do. You would post just that. We're having a sale today. Okay. And you see, if all you do is post the information, kind of like using Facebook as a one-way bullhorn, you know, then you're going to fail. So the call to information is what the post is about. The third piece is even more important, the call to action. In other words, based on what I just told you, what do you want them to do? Based on what I just told all these people who saw me on Facebook, what do I want them to do? And this is one of the big things people leave out of social media is they forget that call to action. They forget to tell people what to do. All they do is describe their products or what they're doing, but they never invite or even demand that you take action based on that. But the most important thing of all is the call to interaction. I'm here to tell you, social media, people ask me all the time, Eric, can you look at my social media? Can you look at my Facebook page and tell me what I'm doing wrong or tell me if I'm doing it right? And so I will go on their social media page. I will go on and say their Facebook page and I'll give it a good three seconds. I will do a really deep dive in three seconds. And what I mean by that is I'm looking at one thing. I'm looking for one thing to determine success or failure. Am I counting the number of followers? Not really, although that is important. Am I counting the number of likes on a post? No. Likes are lazy. Ignore likes. Likes, don't you ever, don't you ever base your success in social media for your business on how many likes you get? Because likes don't require any, they don't require any effort. Basically, it's like they see something come across from a company they like, they're gonna hit like, not even read it. And just keep it going. You got no top of mind awareness. They weren't thinking about you. Shares are better because that means that the post is going to be shared on someone else's wall. But if you really want to know the truth, if you were to ask me, Eric, am I doing it right or am I doing it wrong on social media? Here's what I would do. I would go to your Facebook page, uh, your business page, 
and I would look at the posts you did and I would count the number of comments. The true measure of success in social media is how many comments you get, not likes, not shares, comments. Just think about what happens when a comment happens. It means people stopped, read your post, focused on what you said, and then interacted with you, and then chose to communicate with you. Gone is that one-way mega megaphone. Now it's two-way. And that's really what social media is about. It's about interaction. So some of y'all are saying, well, Eric, can you give us an example? Well, once again, I did this before, but I'm going to give you an example from a retailer standpoint. So let's say that you have a dress shop. So you might have a picture of a beautiful dress, okay, uh, as the picture. And then here is the post. Just got three of these beautiful little numbers in yesterday. Better come in quick as they won't be here by closing. What shoes would you wear with this? Now, take that post apart because it actually has all those ingredients we talked about. First, does it have a call to attention? The picture that makes you stop. Yes. And whether it's this picture or another picture or whatever, it doesn't matter. But it's got to have a picture. Second, the call to information. What is this post about? Well, let's see. Just got three of these beautiful little numbers in yesterday. In other words, we just got three of these dresses in. The next piece is what? The call to action. What do we want them to do based on what I just told them? Well, here it is. Better come in quick because they won't be here by closing. But the final piece is the most important piece, and that's the call to interaction. In other words, we have to ask them a question. Every post you do in social media should always end in a question. If you want people to comment, you end it in a question. People will not comment just because, but they will if you ask them a question. So make sure that every social media you post you do ends in a question. And it can't be a yes or no question. It needs to be a more open-ended question. So take a look. You can obviously see what I did here. What shoes would you wear with this? Okay? This is an example of the kind of post that a retailer should be doing. Okay? Because really what you want is you want people in your store. So the better come in quick is one of the calls to action you're going to use quite a bit. Maybe different words, but that's going to be one of your goals. Keep in mind, you could also change it up a little and say, uh, print this post out like a coupon and bring it in, you know, or, you know, call us and mention you saw it here. The first 10 people will get blah, blah, blah. There's so many ways you could approach this, but just know your goal is to get them to contact you. Your goal is to get them to come in your store. Get visual. I tell people all the time. Use picture-based social media tools. I told you everyone's visual. Everyone would rather watch a video than read a post. People are very visual. And the younger you are, the more visual you are. And so you've got to realize that if all you're doing is typing words on paper, no one's going to just sit there and read that. So the social media tools that do the best uh, with visual are Instagram and I'll be honest, Pinterest. And they both kind of hit two different groups. Instagram is more of a younger group. You know, they're owned by Facebook. And to be honest, everyone left, uh, everyone under 30 left Facebook and went to Instagram. Why? Interestingly enough, because of their parents. You see, social media works when communication happens. And Facebook is based on you having friends. But what Facebook doesn't quite get is that we have different types of friends. For instance, I have friends my age. And I also have friends who are relatives and friends who are older and maybe even friends who are younger. But the point is I have different types of friends. When kids went on to Facebook first, and they were, they were the first ones on it, they loved it because all of a sudden they could just talk with their friends, post up, and their friends would talk back. And then, and then it happened. 
their mom got on Facebook and requested to be their friend. When that happened, everything changed. Because now, knowing that your mom was reading every post you did, you stopped posting half of the stuff you did. Kids got sick of that. They got sick of their parents monitoring them on Facebook. Uh, so what did they do? They quit Facebook and went out and got an Instagram account. So everyone under 30 pretty much left Facebook. But Facebook saw that happening and they bought Instagram. So they still win. Now, is Instagram slowly becoming populated by parents? Yes. And when that happens, they will leave again. And some people think that kids are moving to Snapchat or TikTok or some other stuff. It's a constant thing where parents are chasing their children on social media. So if you want visual, Instagram is still the key, but you're still looking. Instagram is pretty much kids uh, 30 and under. And Facebook is pretty much, and Pinterest, I'll be honest, is pretty much, uh, well, it's women 30 and older. Okay. Pinterest is primarily women 30 and older. And that's because Pinterest is, uh, it goes after some very unique subjects that a lot of women really enjoy. And those are fashion, architecture, crafts, uh, cooking. Uh, and I'm not trying to be stereotypical here. I'm just saying uh, when it came out, the group that joined it the most quick were women. And so therefore a lot of their topics became uh, kind of the subjects that most people put on Pinterest. Eric, I have a question, and that yeah. was actually my, my list on Pinterest, so thank you for that. But uh, what do you think about the, um, the editing tools where you can add text into the pictures? Do you think you should just do a picture, or should you um, write the copy separately from the picture, or should you add it in to the picture? That's a great question, Leslie. And Instagram and Pinterest differ a little on that. In both cases, you can upload any picture you want and the picture could have text on it. And in fact, Instagram uh, even has a built-in tool in their app to add text onto a picture if you use the Instagram app. So yes, uh, text can always strengthen the message of a picture. So too many times we often assume that people know what we mean whereas text can even strengthen it even more. I tell people that on their websites too, that if they're gonna have a slideshow up at the top, you know, with pictures going by on their homepage of their website, add text to it to strengthen whatever they're trying to show there, okay? So uh, the difference mainly between Instagram and Pinterest as it relates to where to put text is that Pinterest does allow you to put a web address in the caption. Okay, a web address, meaning a clickable web address. Instagram does not. You cannot put a clickable link in an Instagram caption. All you can do is put in it is a put a clickable link in, an, in your Instagram profile and tell people to go back to it and tell people to go. So for instance, let's say you sell dresses and you're using Instagram and you have a lot of followers and you're posting pictures of these dresses or, or your models in those dresses and someone wants to buy one. Typically on those on those pinch on those Instagram accounts, you're going to see them say something to the effect of "Please go to my profile for the link to the website." Okay, uh, so the caption in Instagram is very important because that's where you can talk about the dress itself. You know, describe it, even how they can go find it, or even a phone number they can call you. But in Pinterest, you can actually put a clickable link directly to that dress if you have an e-commerce site. So a lot of it's going to depend. Um, on what you do, but I do, to, to make a short answer long, um, I do believe that text is very important on a photo. I hope that Thank you. I, I was wondering about that. And I know that uh, on Pinterest, it's almost always, it seems very linked. Every time you look at something mm -hmm. um, to get more information, it's always directing you to a website. Oh, definitely. It, it always is. And Instagram, for whatever reason, will not do that. You cannot put a clickable link in, in an Instagram post. Uh, you can also use Google Shopping Feeds. Uh, now, Google Shopping Feeds are kind of cool because basically what they are is you already have an e-commerce site, okay? 
In other words, you're selling stuff on your website, but you wish more people saw your products. Well, with Google, you can create what's called a shopping feed, which basically means Google will go to your website, grab the products or links to those products you already have on your website. And then when people search for those products, Google will actually show those products up at the top of the search results. Your actual products from your website would actually start showing up alongside those of your competitors. A lot of people use that for price comparison, okay? But it's called a Google shopping feed and most e-commerce software supports it, okay? If some people are at, typically ask me at this point, Eric, if you are a retailer, what, you know, what e-commerce software would you recommend? I'm a big fan of Shopify. Shopify.com, S-H-O-P-I-F-Y.com, Shopify. I, I love it and it's the biggest one out there and it can do just about anything and it's very safe and secure. And they handle everything from taking credit cards to everything. Uh, which if you're in e-commerce is very important. And of course it ties into Google shopping feeds very easily. And remember Instagram now supports videos, okay? And Pinterest too. You can upload videos into these. And Instagram even is trying to compete with TikTok. It's, it's interesting watching the fight between Instagram and TikTok uh, because uh, you know TikTok's all about short little videos and Instagram didn't really have that. So they created what's called Reels. And it's really interesting. Uh, so, but Instagram supports videos. So if you're going to decide to do videos like your open box video, you don't have to upload those directly to your website. You could upload them directly to Instagram or Pinterest uh, so that your uh, clients can see or your potential clients can see them. Email newsletters. This is going to be one of the major pieces as well. I'll be honest with you. Email is still one of the best, 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 best ways to market your company. And before you start saying, what do you mean email, Eric? I'm not a spammer. I don't want to just start spamming millions of people with my products when I get in trouble. Yeah, if you're a spammer. It goes back to the Internet Communications Act of 1996, believe it or not. And what Congress did, yeah, that's right, Congress, they had the Can Spam Act is what they called it. And basically it said, you cannot email to someone without their, uh, you cannot email a business or solicitation to someone without them having given you their email for that purpose. Okay, try to make sure I word that correctly. And so I tell people all the time, as long as you follow the rules, you're fine. You say, well, what do you mean? I can't, how am I gonna get their permission? Well, the key is to get those email addresses. The key is to go out there and get those email addresses, okay? You're going to collect them from all over the place, whether it be a conference, whether it be from a business card, but in every case, you're going to say, hey, can I, you know, send you some more information about this or that? And that's how they're getting on your email list. You know, my email list has thousands and thousands and thousands of people in it. And I got every one of those addresses one at a time. So uh, you're going to get them. You're going to get them. But do not buy a list, whatever you owe, please. Do not ever go out and buy an email list. Number one, it's illegal. And number two, you're not going to get any help out of it because if you buy one of those lists and then send something to it, you're going to get marked as a spammer and you'll never get to email anything again. You will be blocked everywhere and no one will be able to find you. So don't even fall for that. Don't ever buy an email list, ever. If you're going to do this, you need to use a program to help manage it and a program to help you email them out. I do not recommend if you're gonna be sending out a newsletter that you do it from say Outlook or your email program or even your Gmail account. Not at all. Because if something goes wrong, if you get marked as a spammer, it's gonna come back on that account. I recommend using 
a larger service whose only job is to do this. And the two biggest ones out there are Constant Contact and MailChimp. I like them both, okay? Uh, and so check them both out. I think uh, your SBDC counselors also have a partnership with Constant Contact that they might be able to get you a special deal, okay? Uh, and what those do is those, your email that you're gonna send out to all these people, it goes, it goes out from them, not from you. And also, Constant Contact and MailChimp are considered what we call um, uh, whitelisted. You know, there's blacklisted and whitelisted. Uh, blacklisted means it's blocked. Whitelisted means they're safe. And so they're considered safe already because they kind of take care of any problems themselves. And so you're already a step ahead if you use one of these two programs. Do not start sending stuff out just from your email account or you'll start getting blocked and it's a pain to get unlocked. Push new products visually. If you're gonna do email newsletters, I want pictures in it. It can't just be text. It can't just be a letter from you. Oh my gosh, how boring. It needs to be pictures. You know, for me, it's videos. You know, uh, there's a big old video there and they can just click on it. So that's what they see online. Link to your videos if you have videos. And now I highly recommend it. If you're gonna start doing videos, you know, and posting them on YouTube, which is where they should all go, then link to them from your newsletter. Your newsletter actually becomes an avenue for you to drive more people to your videos. One last thing, you've also got to realize the right frequency to send these things. If you're not sending any, if you're going to do an email newsletter, if you're going to commit to doing an email newsletter and you start sending it out, you better be doing it at least once a month. If, you're, if you can't do it once a month, then don't even do it, okay? But I'm also not saying do it every day. That might be too much and you'll fill someone's inbox and they will unsubscribe they may like what you do, but they're getting so much of it. What you're gonna to have to do is test it. And you're also gonna to have to balance the amount of content, the amount of content to advertising in each email. For me, I've discovered through testing that about 80, 20 works. In other words, I do 80% content. In other words, stuff they could use, tips, tricks, kind of like this is right here, 80% content, 20% advertising. If you do too much advertising, they will see you as spam and they'll just eventually mark you as spam or unsubscribe because they, no one wants to take their time to be advertised to. So give them a reason to keep opening your email. Now, this subject typically has a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of questions. So I well, I was going to ask you one question and then, yes. of course, anybody that wants to type questions, please feel free. But on your email, um, your newsletter, which I know we don't call it a newsletter, but do you think a lot of pictures in the newsletter also? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Now make sure you're not uploading like super huge pictures that take a while for it to download. You know what I'm saying? Try to be a little efficient about that. Uh, MailChimp and Constant Contact will try to kind of shrink them a little bit, but you know, if I'm out and about and I'm on my phone and I'm looking at your email and I'm sitting there watching a picture slowly build up, I'm not going to stick around for that. So yeah, do pictures, but make sure they're appropriate. Okay, make sure they're appropriate. Make sure there was a reason for even having pictures. It can't just be random stock pictures just for the heck of it. Okay. Okay, other questions for retailers. Uh, while we're waiting for questions, I do want to update everybody on some of the other webinars that we have going on. We have um, tomorrow uh, mental health and COVID-19 for small business, how to stay um, mentally and physically healthy. We also have um, maintaining personal uh, privacy while you, wh while you own your business. That's coming up this week. And we also have Eric coming on Friday with cut your costs by moving to the cloud. So I did want to remind everyone that we do have those coming up this week. And we have a comment um, from Peter. Thanks, Eric. Great content, clearly and enthusiastically presented, like always. 
Uh, okay. <laughs> Let me throw, thank you, Peter. Let me throw one more thing out that I get asked by retailers. Uh, because a lot of retailers say, Eric, what about QR codes? Uh, you know, those little square, weird looking things that you can scan with your phone? There's a lot of people pushing those right now. I'm not a huge fan. I'm not a huge fan of QR codes at all. And the main reason is because what's stored in that QR code and that little code that your phone has to scan is basically a web address. And I remember back in the day when they were real popular and you saw them everywhere and you would see them at the airport. The reason they fail is because it took too much work to be advertised to. People would see a QR code and in order to know what it even said, you had to pull out your phone, hopefully have an app on it that would actually scan it and then sit there while they're, they're being advertised to. People just didn't do it. And so it had a very high cool factor, but it didn't work. We still see a lot of apps that have, um, you know, use codes and read UPCs and QRs and all that, but they're usually used internally. I know Walmart uses that. Uh, it's where you can check the price on any item in a store with the app, with the Walmart app, you can just scan it and it'll tell you the price. So there are some internal things that you can do with that that are pretty cool. But as to just using QR codes in general, not a fan at all. The only time I've ever used a QR code is that I know that when um, we were starting to open up a little bit, uh, the only time I have ever used a QR code is scanning when we have been in a restaurant, the menu. Mm -hmm. And that's the only, as far as advertising, I, I have not used a QR code to see about what kind of product or anything like that. And I did want to tell you also, uh, Dominique says, this was amazing. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dominique. And you're right. The reason you scanned it was because you wanted to see the menu, right? Yes, that was the only reason why exactly. I... I and that was I it. Yeah, and I had to figure out how to use it. See, there has to be a reason. No one's going to scan something just to be advertised to. You got to give them a reason, a benefit that outweighs the time it takes to do all that. So, yeah, you just, you just prove the point right there. So retailers also need to realize that a lot of their, a lot of their customers will, will not darken the door of their store ever. When you go online, you expand your market beyond what is drivable to your store, beyond a five mile, 10 mile, 50 mile radius of your store. You expand it to national and in some cases international. So realize that your online, and dare I say, is more important than your brick and mortar store. And when I say more important, the online is where you should be spending the majority of your marketing money. Because like I said, 99% of the people their first impression of your business will be something they found online, whether it be your website, your social media account, a video. If you're not investing in those things, your competitors are already capturing those clients. Okay, any other questions? I think that is, uh, we do not have any other questions coming in. So I, do you have any last thoughts before we pop off for today? Yeah, just on your business cards, one last little final little bonus tip. Make sure that your web address is on your business cards. That way, when you hand them out, people can see that. Make sure your email address is on there too. People want to connect digitally. And if you're going to put your, if you're going to put your web address out there, if your web address has more than one word in it, then I want you to capitalize the first letter of each word but lowercase the rest of it. It makes it more easy for the human eye to read it because uppercase, lowercase doesn't matter when they type it into the computer. So if you write it on your business cards or have your business card done, what I don't want is an all uppercase web address. I don't want an all lowercase email address. I don't want all uppercase or all lowercase, all upper or all lower. I like mixed case because your eye can more easily break the words apart and there's less likely to be a spelling mistake when they type it in. I did want to tell everyone that uh, uh, Eric was referencing uh, early in the presentation, the presentation that he was refer referencing about the web uh, small business websites was 
the small business website, the 10 mistakes you must not make is what he's referring to. And I put the link in if anyone wants to find that on our live and on-demand webinars. Also, Peter has asked if this will get, if this will be emailed. Yes, the presentation will be emailed to all the attendees today. Definitely. And like, you know, I, maybe I don't mention this enough, but every presentation I do, can you can go back and watch again, or you can watch the ones you missed. They're all on demand. And uh, Leslie, is there an easy, you just go to NMS, NMS BDC and click on events. How do they see all these on demand ones? They yeah, right they out? are. Um, I chatted over the links for anyone that wants to pick copy and paste the links into you know, some document on their computer, computer, or they can pick it up right now. Um, the easiest thing is to go to nmsbdc.org and go to the event page. And you can go to um, the live, you can register for the live webinars, but you can also register for the pre-recorded on demand ones. We have those and then we put them up on YouTube because, you know, Eric tells us YouTube. So mm -hmm. we put them there. So we make it very easy for you guys to get the information that you need. Excellent. All right. I think if there's no more questions, we are going to be uh, um, closing out for today and we will see you next time. And Eric, we will see you for cutting your costs by moving to the cloud on Friday. So you guys have a great you. rest of your day. Bye.